evening, everyone. It is an honor to introduce the first visitor that the TASA Speaker Series is fortunate enough to host this school year, Dr. Marcelo Gleiser, the Appleton Professor of Natural Philosophy and a Professor of Physics and Astronomy at Dartmouth College. A world-renowned theoretical physicist, Dr. Marcelo Gleiser received the 1994 Presidential Faculty Fellows <coughs> Award from the White House and is a Fellow of the American Physical Society. In 2019, Dr. Gleiser was awarded the Templeton Prize, an honor annually accorded to one individual whose exceptional achievements embody the late Sir John Templeton's founding vision of harnessing the power of the sciences to explore the deepest questions of the universe and of humankind's place and purpose within it. An honor that Dr. Gleiser shares with past laureates, Mother Teresa, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, and the Dalai Lama. Dr. Gleiser has published thousands of essays and op-eds in the world's most prestigious publications, as well as hundreds of peer-reviewed articles, and Dr. Gleiser's books, which include The Island of Knowledge, The Limits of Science and the Search for Meaning, A Tear at the Edge of Creation, and The Simple Beauty of the Unexpected have been published in 15 languages. Dr. Gleiser currently directs the Institute for Cross-Disciplinary Engagement at Dartmouth College. We are incredibly lucky to be able to listen to his presentation tonight. Please welcome Dr. Gleiser. Hi everyone, and I've been told that I do not do good maths, so I'm making it off. Good. But note the cosmic theme of the maths. Um, so first of all, I'm very, very thankful for this invitation. I'm very, very happy to be here and to meet so many of you in person, and I have, which is great. And I'm also happy to be the one that is bringing back the speaker series to life, which is also great. So this is like a, a night for celebration, really, here at Taxis, which is, which is a wonderful thing. And um, so when I was invited, you know, they've asked me to talk about topics that could be interesting for us, all of us, you know, for, to think about not just of us in the very moment that we're living, but bigger questions, you know, questions that have some sort of impact for the kind of persons we are, for the way we look at life, the way we think about the world, and we think about the future, because, you know, we're all sharing this moment on this planet together, right? So I put together this conversation. I hope it will be a conversation. I'll talk for a while, but at some point, I hope you guys are going to ask questions, right? In which I bring out topics that sound very different from one another, like extra ET. It's not the Steven Spielberg ET, but it is extraterrestrials. And AI is artificial intelligence. And what do these things have in common? And why did they matter to us? Hopefully, I'll explain to you soon. Um, and the way I want to introduce this is by showing you a two-minute video, okay, which is heavy. I'm telling you right now, it is intense, and it's called Our Story in Two Minutes, okay? And it's a, you can see it on YouTube. It's there. And it's basically a collage of photographs that tell the whole history of existence from the Big Bang until the end. Okay, and in between this cosmic beginning and this cosmic ending, there is us, you know, the story of our civilization, of humanity in this planet. But it puts it into a context, which I think is really interesting for us to see, but fasten your seatbelt, this is not a fairy tale. Okay, it's intense. Although fairy tales can be pretty intense too. Right? <laughs> Thank you. 
my rivers is terrible. But you figure out that uh, this is a story that tells, you can look at this video in many, many ways, and I think you have the whole curriculum of the high school right here, right? Everything is in here, right? from the sciences to history to uh, politics, right? Geopolitics, it's all here. But the important thing for us is to understand that it starts from the origin of everything. It goes to the evolution of life. We show up in this planet. We do things in this planet, good things, but mostly you know, there was art, there was the Mona Lisa, the Renaissance, but also horrible things, right? And, uh, and it ends with the end of the universe itself. So it's the idea that we belong to the history of the universe. You know, you cannot separate who we are from this big way of thinking about the world. And we are just part of that. And in fact, this is not new. You know, cultures from all times across the whole planet have asked this very simple question, you know, which is not simple at all. It's easy to ask. It's extremely hard to answer, which is how come we're here? Where did we come from? I mean, Right? I mean, have you ever thought about this? I mean, when did the stars and chemistry of the universe made a planet that is able to have life and to sustain life for so many, so many years? So this is not a scientific question. This is a question about our humanity. You know, it was asked way before science existed. And there were stories of creation, which are called creation myths. And every culture you can think of across the world across time has asked this question and came up with stories of origins. And if you're familiar, for example, with the Bible and the Old Testament, how does it start? It starts with Genesis, you know, there God created the world in, in six days, rested on the seventh, separating light from darkness. That is a narrative of creation. Different cultures have different stories to tell, right? And of course, you come from all over the world, you know, from your own countries and different cult cultures in those countries that have narratives like this. So science is a newcomer to this, in which we try to organize what we learn about the universe to make sense of that question and also this question. You know, is there a purple to life, purpose to life? Because honestly, um, if you look around the, the universe, if you look around our solar system, you know, I was saying uh, to some friends, I think it was last night, that if you go and look at the moon right now, the moon is going to be full on the 20th of October. Next to the moon, there is an incredibly bright dot of light. Anybody knows what that is? It's Jupiter, right? So Jupiter is super strong in the sky right now. But Jupiter is a huge ball of ice gas, very, very cold gas, has no life there. Mars definitely has no life. Venus is a total hell. I mean, everybody that thinks that Venus is a, this romantic, poetic thing should go visit Venus because Venus actually, there's rains of sulfuric acid, it stinks of rotten egg, and it's 500 degrees Celsius during the day. So it's so hot that the, 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 the rocks, they glow at night. But it's not a place to spend a vacation at all, right? I mean, it's a, it's a really hard, hostile place. So Earth is different, right? There is something about this planet that allows for us to exist with all the other creatures that exist here. So you start asking, because we are different from an ant or, or from a gorilla, you know, because we actually ask questions about meaning, right, about who we are. Why do we wake up every day? I mean, what is the point, right? Do you have a point in waking up every day? So questions like this about the purpose of things are unique to our species. So we are a big question mark in many ways, right? We try to figure out who we are, and we've been doing that in many different ways, through philosophy, through arts, through poetry, through science, right? And all these different ways of knowing, they combine, you know, to create a sense of history, a sense of we humans are this way or that way. And that sense of who we are changes with time, right? So if you have this conversation in ancient Greece, you're going to have different kinds of answers from the Renaissance. You have different kinds of answers from now, right? And if you jump now to the scientific story, right? We have advanced since the 1600s to create incredible instruments that are able to amplify our view of reality. I call like telescopes and microscopes. They are 
reality amplifiers. They allow us to see aspects of the world that you could not see with our five senses, right? So this morning, I don't know if some of you were here, I was telling people, um, if you look around and you think that what you see and what you hear is the real world, you're completely wrong. You're only a little bit right because what we see with our eyes and what you hear with our ears is a small sliver of what's actually going on around here. There are tons of electromagnetic radiation. There are particles raining from the skies going through us, trillions of them per second. And we have no idea this is happening unless you build the instruments to see it. So telescopes like this guy here is called the Hubble Space Telescope. The Hubble Space Telescope was from the 1990s. It's perhaps the most successful scientific instrument in history. Why? Well, because it helped us retell the history of the universe. You know, what are stars like? There, there, we found out that there are many planets that circle pretty much most stars. You know, so the idea that the sun that has Mercury, Venus, us, you know, Earth, and then the other planets is unique, that is not true. Almost every star in the universe has planets around it. Now think about that for a second, right? I mean, that means that there are trillions of worlds that potentially could have life. But yet you look around and you don't see it, right? So what we have done through this uh, tremendous expansion of knowledge is we started to look at different parts of the universe and start to understand it better. So for example, Enceladus, right? So that is a moon of Saturn that has that has uh, volcanoes that expel ice, that expel ice, uh, frozen salt, like icicles of, of, of sodium chloride and methane and a bunch of other stuff. So it's geologically active, okay? But it's a moon way, way out there. The surface temperature of that moon is like minus 150 degrees. So it's incredibly cold. But we can actually know these things because we can build instruments that actually fly around it. Just think about that, right? I mean, if you ever play with a, uh, a, a remote control car, right, as a toy, then you try to move it around and stuff, you know it's hard. Imagine sending a spaceship to a world that is millions and hundreds of millions of kilometers away from us and control everything from a distance, right, without anybody there taking care of it, right? And it goes to worlds that like that and figure out, oh, look at that, that is, a surface full of ice, there are craters on one side, there are valleys, there are cracks on the surface, right? So this is a, is a world full of interesting stuff. And it's so complex that people that are interested in studying life say that, well, there may not be life there, but we can learn a lot about life in other places in the universe by looking at worlds like this. And the other one is just a nebula, it's called the horse head nebula. As you can see, it looks like a horse head, right? And that place is where stars are born. So there are baby stars being born there. And if you look more carefully, carefully through it, you're gonna see that they're just not stars, but there are little baby planets that are born with the stars. So when the sun was born, so were all the planets of the solar system. So we are all born together. In fact, all the matter that became planets, like all the planets, they're the leftover stuff that didn't become the sun. You know, so the sun's, you know, because Big, big ball of, of, of helium and, and hydrogen attracted a lot of matter and everything that was left around became the planets. So we're all born together, right? And science has evolved so much that we now can make a picture, a map of the history of the universe, right? And I go give a whole talk, I could give a whole course just on this slide, right? Because this slide basically tells the whole history of all the way on the left there, the Big Bang, the events that gave rise to everything. And by the way, there is a picture in the science building. I was just there visiting the lab. that has a picture of the Big Bang. It should be taken down <laughs> because it looks like an explosion, <laughs> like a bomb. And the Big Bang was not a bomb explosion. That's not the bomb, by the way. Okay. But um, anyways, but the idea is that there was an event that gave rise to the origin of time <clears throat> as we know it about 14 billion years ago. And matter was completely broken down into a bunch of particles. They started to get organized into the first atoms. See that colorful slab, slab there? That's when the first atoms appeared. And then there's a whole series of, of, of 
events until about 200 million years after the Big Bang. The first stars were born. Fast forward 1 billion years, galaxies. You know, galaxies are basically collections of stars. And then fast forward to <clears throat> today, you have a galaxy like that one, all the way in the corner there, which is not the Milky Way. Why is it not the Milky Way? Anybody knows? Could we take a picture of our own galaxy? We can't even go to Mars, right? I mean, pretty much. So to get a picture like that from a galaxy, you have to look at it from millions of light years away. Okay, so that is a picture of a galaxy that kind of looks like ours, but it's definitely not ours, right? But we know a lot about it now. For example, we know that every giant galaxy, spiral galaxy like that has a giant black hole in the middle of it that can weigh three million times more than the sun. So it's a huge cosmic drain. You know, like when you take your bath uh, and you pull the drain and you see the water spiraling around in, that is essentially what you see in the galaxy. So, but instead of a water going in, there's a bunch of stellar matter going into the black hole over there. And fortunately, we, meaning we, the solar system, are far enough away that we don't feel it. Sort of like if you have a hurricane in the Caribbean, but you're swimming in Rio, you're not going to be sucked into the, you know, the, the hurricane over there because you're not going to feel the winds. So if you're far enough away from the center of the galaxy, you won't feel the presence of the black hole. But if you have a real bad enemy, that's the place to send that person. You never come back to you. It's just a one-way trip. Anyways, so we now take pictures like this. Okay, this is one of the most <laughs> amazing pictures ever taken. What is this, right? You say, oh, look at that. You know, there are a few blurs over there and stuff, and then a bunch of stars. Well, each dot of light that you see in this picture is a galaxy. Okay? It just happens that some of these galaxies are so far away that you can't resolve them very well. So you look at that one on the left there. Let me see if I can. Uh, look at that one on the left, and you see that guy. So if you could zoom into other ones, you'd see the same thing. So what is a galaxy? A galaxy is a collection of literally billions, billions of stars, okay? And all of them, pretty much most of them, have planets. So the question you have is, in a universe this big, right, are we alone, right? Are we that special? Well, if you go back to the Renaissance, right, if you ask people in the Renaissance, they'll say, well, yeah, the Earth, is the center of everything. The earth doesn't move. And we are made in the image of God. And everything revolves around us in circles. That was the, that was the universe of the Renaissance, the universe that Dr. Love here teaches when he's teaching the universe of Dante, because that was the, what Dante does is that he brings together Aristotelian ideas. So this is model of the earth in the center is with circles around it is from Aristotle, even before Aristotle, but then you marry that with Christianity and you have Dante's cosmos, so to speak. And this is a completely different story, which is interesting because it tells you about truth, right? About what is the nature of truth in science? Everybody says, well, science is about being sure of everything in a final sense, like I know something. And yes, in some situations that's true if i get a, a rock right from a certain height and i let it go and hit the ground then i can calculate exactly how long it's going to take that's true two plus two plus four that's true but the way we look at the universe and the way we fit into that universe we humans who are we and how we fit in that universe that changes in time and it depends how we look at nature how we look at the space so in the 15-1600s, we had, first of all, naked eye astronomy, telescopes only about 1610 or so. But now we have these huge machines that tell us a completely different story of the universe and who we are. So, and why is that important? Well, because this is our home. You know, we live in, on Earth, but we actually live in this place. Right? And each one of these points is millions of light years away from one another. So if I had time, I would explain more about speed of light, etc. But it suffices to say that um, if you blink your eye right now, light can, give seven, can go seven and a half times around the Earth. So poof, blink your eye seven and a half times around the Earth. If the sun exploded right now, we would find out in eight minutes. 
because that's how long it takes for light to travel from the sun to us. It'll be the last thing we'd ever know because if the sun goes, we go, right? That is the bye. The sun exploded and that's it. Um, but the point is that light takes a while to get to us. So when you're looking at the night sky, when you're looking at those stars, even when you look at the moon, the moon is about one and a half second away, light second away from us. You're never seeing things in the present. You're always seeing things in the past. So the skies are a massive uh, time machine because you look at a star and say, oh, that star is 10 light years away. What does that mean? That means that light left that star 10 years ago, is traveling towards us for 10 years at 300,000 kilometers per second, right? And then we see it. And so every time you look at the skies, you're looking to the past. And if you have big telescopes, you can look really deep into the sky and you can see stuff like this, which is those galaxies are hundreds of millions of light years away from us. So when you take a picture like that, you're seeing the history of the universe 100 million, 200 million years ago. And nowadays you can do things to billions of years. Remember when I mentioned that um, the universe is about 14 billion years ago, uh, of age since the bank? That means that we can actually reconstruct that story all the way to the beginning. And then you know about this plurality of worlds, right? And you have to ask, right, are we alone? Are, we, are there aliens out there in the other worlds looking at us right now the same way that we are looking, at, looking for them, right? And of course, some people are like, definitely, they're here, they're right here. I just can't see them because, you know, they are so advanced technologically that, uh, that we don't see them. They have this beautiful stealth mode that is invisible to us. And other people say, well, I don't know. And there was a very famous Italian scientist called Enrico Fermi that in 1952 came up with this question, where is everybody? And what did he mean by that? He said, well, you know, if our galaxy is about 10 billion years of age, 10 billion years old, okay? If a civilization was born just a million years before us, okay, so in a million years compared to 10 billions is nothing, right? It would have developed technology, and if they could travel at a tenth of the speed of light, they would have colonized the whole galaxy already. So where are the aliens? So that was his question. That's called the Fermi paradox. So if there is life elsewhere, it should have been around, it should have been here. And, and there is a really funny book, um, which is called Where is Everybody, which has 50 answers to the Fermi paradox, okay? And one of them is there, is that um, we are an experiment the same way that we play with petri dishes and we make them play with bacteria, you know, the aliens made us to see what would happen if they put a little bit of intelligence in some primates, you know? So smart monkeys, what are they gonna do, right? And they're just looking at us the same way that we look in a zoo and animals, they're looking at us from a distance, we just don't know about that. Others say that actually, you know, we are just a computer simulation, right? I don't know if you, you're too young to have seen the matrix, maybe you have seen it, I don't know, but the idea is, you know The Sims, right? The video game, The Sims? Now imagine a super advanced version of The Sims where each character actually thinks that he or she is alive, autonomous. They can make their own choices. They can't, but they may believe they do. And you say, that's a silly question. I mean, how could it possibly be a simulation? It turns out that very smart philosophers are asking that kind of question. And the more you think about it, the less obvious it is how to answer it. Because it's not that we, I'm sure I'm not a simulation, that's not good enough. How can you prove that you're not a simulation? And that's where things get interesting. You really can't, right? Um, and I will talk a little bit more about that later. But you go to the YouTube and you can see videos like that one, which is an alien autopsy. <laughs> so basically someone said that, yeah, the aliens came, 1950 something, they fell down in Area 51, right in the desert, I think it was Nevada. Some of them were captured and there are videos of that. That's total fakery. There is zero, zero evidence that any alien intelligence ever came here. They certainly didn't build the pyramids of Egypt, although some people say they did. And that is just not the case. So that makes us feel a little lonely, 
right? In the sense that, wow, if that's true, then are we completely isolated here? You know, what's going on? And some people say, well, you know, maybe they did travel here using wild stuff like this, wormholes in time. So in space, what's a wormhole? So if you think of a universe as a sheet, you can, instead of going around the whole distance, which would take a very long time, you can create tunnels in space where you just go across much faster, okay? And that's um, it's called wormholes. It was actually an idea that Einstein had um, in the 1930s or something like that. But the problem with wormholes, as far as we know, and if you've seen a movie called Interstellar, a movie called Contact, what, 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 Star Trek, I mean, wormholes always appear, right? The idea that you can travel incredible distances in a, in a second. Um, the problem is that, at least from what we understand now of physics, they are completely impossible to exist. Which means that interstellar travel, you know, for us to go to another star, Elon Musk really wants to go to Mars, right? But to go to other stars is really very hard. Just to give you an idea, the closest star to us is called Proxima Centauri, Alpha Centauri. It stays, it's at about four and a half light years away from us. So that means it takes light four and a half years to, to get here from there. So if aliens existed there and you wanted to have a conversation, that means you'd send a radio wave. Radio waves travel at the speed of light. Say, hey aliens, four and a half years. And then it gets there. They respond, hey people from the earth, nine years. Right, because it takes that long for the light to travel. So you really can't do that. So you say, okay, I'm gonna send a spaceship. So you take the fastest spaceship that we have now to go to Alpha Centauri. Do you know how long it would take to get there? 100,000 years. And that spaceship is traveling at 50,000 kilometers an hour. If you think a Ferrari is fast, 50,000 kilometers an hour, and it takes about 100,000 years. So to go from a star to another star is incredibly hard, right? Which means we're not gonna go anywhere for a very, very long time. There are no wormholes, we're not going to go anywhere. Although you could do this, you know, if Elon Musk is right, you could go to Mars and you could create some kind of Earth-like colony. Notice the American flag there. It must have been an American artist or maybe a NASA paid guy that did this, right? The point is that, is this feasible? Maybe in hundreds and hundreds of years, okay? And is it worth it? Well, it depends where you come from, right? There are commercial reasons to go explore space. It's not just about the spirit of adventure. It's about mining asteroids, right? It's about military control over the moon. Who owns the moon? Nobody, right? So well, China has a chunk of it, United States has. So people are putting stuff on the moon, but who owns the real estate? No one, right? And, and so what do you do with that? And so there is an agreement that space belongs to, the, to humanity, but We'll see who uh, is going to respect that. And so the idea of colonization, just like we did here on Earth, like the Europeans moved out of the Africa and the Americas, it's going to happen to space. So maybe the aliens are us. Remember when I mentioned that the advanced civilization could have colonized the galaxy? So maybe very slowly, over hundreds of thousands of years, we are the ones that are going to spread life across the galaxy, right? But for that, we need to survive, right? And there is Thais is there. So you know what that is? <laughs> that is a really famous picture. It's called the pale blue dot. Okay, so what happened is there was a, a spaceship called Voyager 1 that was sent in the 1970s to explore Saturn, Jupiter, etc. And Carl Sagan, I don't know if you ever heard of Carl Sagan, he was a super famous astronomer and popularizer of science. He had a, a series on TV called Cosmos that was epoch-making. It was like, to this day, is the most watched documentary in history of television in any country called Cosmos. Uh, there's a new version with Neil deGrasse Tyson. Honestly, it's not half as good. But anyways, um, that pale blue dot is a picture of our planet seen from Saturn. So that's Earth. So time is somewhere in there. So is everything else that exists in this planet, right? And everything that we have ever made is in that little pale blue dot. So when you look at the Earth from a very far away perspective, 
we're really very tiny. And a lot of people through history said, you know, um, that is awful because the more you know about the universe, the less important we become. You know, in the 1500s, we're the center of everything. We're the best, maybe God's image. And now what is science telling us? Well, science telling us the universe is huge, trillions of worlds and planets and, and ours is just one of them. And so the story I'm telling you tonight is that that is not the right way to look at things. The right way to look at things is to think of Earth in an exceptional way. Earth is not just another planet. Earth is a planet where life is abundant and it's possible and it's fragile. And we are here and somehow it created a species that is able to ask these questions. You know? So as long as we don't find another intelligent alien, and honestly, odds are very small that we're going to, we are how the universe thinks about itself. We are the cosmic consciousness, right? If we didn't exist, nobody would know about the universe. The universe wouldn't have a history because there wouldn't be any intelligent species thinking about these things. So the fact that we are here and we are thinking about these things makes the universe exist from our perspective, right? Which is pretty amazing. And we are also the only species that knows about life, that understands how to tell the history of life, like that video, that very loud video <laughs> in the beginning. Um, so the more we look out into the universe, we are learning more about ourselves. And one of the things that we are learning, which is really important for, well, for, for us, but for my generation, but certainly for your generation, is that this is a very special place. So dreams of going to Mars are very cool, but they're useless from the survival, from the point of view of the survival of our species. You know? uh, if, let's say you could go to Mars in 20 years, who's going to go? You know, who's going to pay to go? Who's going to afford going? Right? And so the vast majority of the now 8 billion people in this planet will stay here with the problems that we have here. So the more we think about the outside, the more we should be focusing back into the world that we live in here, because that is the world that is fundamental to us. So science does help us understand fundamental questions, make us spectacular uh, instruments that allow us to amplify the vision of the universe, the vision of who we are, but it cannot answer all the questions. Right? So even though I'm a theoretical physicist and I work in cosmology, which is the study of the universe, I recognize that science alone cannot solve all our problems. In order to solve our problems, you need to connect different kinds of knowledge. You need to connect the sciences with the humanities, with philosophy, with history, with the arts. Each one of these things tells the story of who we are in a different way. And we need all those stories to make sense of our complexity. You know, we are complicated people, right? So this is extremely important. So this is why I say welcome to the age of Earth-mindedness, because our perception of our place in this planet is changing. And your generation is the generation that is going to push this forward more than anybody else. Um, because we are beginning to understand this like we have not never before, right? So, hooray to science, but also, and I'll transition now to the second part of this very quickly, science is not all wonderful. Science has many problems. It can create a lot of issues, right? So, for example, uh, nuclear energy, great, you can make uh, great, um, uh, you can create energy there, but we also have issues. We can have problems with um, nuclear holocaust. Right? I just read an article today that um, we have about, we meaning United States and Russia, each have about 3,000 functional nuclear warheads right now. 400 of them in the United States are on land which means they are target, easy targets for people to go and hit them. Okay, so that means that, what are we going to do with these things, right? So people don't think about nuclear holocaust anymore. Oh, that's another, that's last century. It is totally not last century, it's totally this century because it's still there and people make mistakes. So there's this really old movie, you know, called War Games, right? which is really cool, which is about with Matthew Broderick when he was a kid, right, that he, breaks into the computer of the National Security Agency, no, the, uh, the Pentagon, the big computer that generates war games between computers. He breaks in, he doesn't know that 
It's a defense computer. And, he, and the computer asks him, do you want to play a war game? And he says, sure, let's play a war game. This is awesome. I'm going to play games you know, with this computer. And it's a real game. And what happens with that is that the game basically becomes serious and the computer sends off or will send off a ton of thermonuclear missiles across, you know, from the United States to then it was the Soviet Union. And the movie goes crazy. It's an amazing movie. And the way they save the world is by, by changing the game into tic-tac-toe. You know, so if you know what tic-tac-toe is, it's a game that doesn't have a winner, logically. So the computer just goes crazy, trying all possible combinations. It can never beat the, the game, and then basically it just burns out or something like that. But the point is that these are serious issues that we should not be forgetting about, right? And right now, we live in the age of AI, right? In the age of bioengineering, in the age of nanotechnology, right? These are sort of, this is the science of the 21st century, which has a huge amount of promise, right? I mean, genetic engineering is remarkable, right? It says it can solve so many uh, problems. Even if you think that perhaps the greatest uh, goal of science is to alleviate human suffering. You know, you want to use science for the benefit of humanity. And there is no question that you can solve and, 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 and heal many, many people from suffering through genetic engineering. But you can also create all sorts of issues, right? You can create super people, for example. You can actually now, there's a technological CRISPR where, I don't know if you know, you know, we are all made of this DNA molecule, right? Which is incredibly long. And each one of us is a book of four chemicals, A, T, C, G, like this, they have the technical names. And each one of us has a sequence of these A, T, C, G, these four big genes. And so what you can do is you can change the order you can inhibit one, you can, you know, and by doing that, you can cure many diseases, but you can also, in principle, and this is really going to happen in less than 20 years, you can go to a clinic and you can say, I want to have a baby that has, that is six foot two, that is good at volleyball, that has an IQ of 140, and has this color skin. And the same way you go to a restaurant and you order from a menu, you're going to go to a genetic baby clinic going to say this is going to happen so is this science fiction not anymore so what do you do with this stuff right i mean you have to have some serious ethical questioning involved in this because you could create for those who can afford a super race within our race and goblins could create super armies because you could define you know you could develop this perfect soldier so what sounds like complete insane sci-fi is not anymore. AI, same thing. <clears throat> so there are two different kinds of AI. One AI is this sci-fi AI that Elon Musk and Stephen Hawking said, do not make a computer smarter than we are because that will be the last invention of humanity. If you make a computer smarter than we are, the computer is going to decide that we are not needed anymore that we're just cumbersome, carbon-based stuff, right? That is not that important. So the same way that you have the power, so we humans could go to the jungles of Africa and machine gun all the gorillas if we want to. But we don't do that because we have moral principles. We don't want to, although as you probably know, there's a lot of poaching with gorillas, but fortunately they are protected an intelligent machine could decide that they will, what morals will they have? We have zero idea, right? I mean, an artificial intelligence is not going to be anything like a human intelligence, if it ever happens. So for example, Elon Musk says that finding, the, designing a machine that is smarter than we are is like summoning the devil, right? Um, that fortunately is, rhetoric. There is no way that we can do that. We have zero idea how the brain works. Right? It is a, cho is a, is a, is a phenomenal it's a phenomenal mystery of science right now. That we know that we have these neurons, we know how they connect to each other, with the synapses, we know how neurotransmitters move around so when you're excited you get a lot of endorphins, you get a lot of adrenaline and stuff like that. 
but we don't know how you are you. Why your brain that looks so much like everybody here has a very similar brain, but yet we are completely different, right? You are, each one of you is very different, yet we have the same stuff in our heads, tiny little thing that makes you you, and it's consistent. So when you wake up tomorrow, hopefully you're going to be feeling like your student self. Otherwise, you're in big trouble, right? So, so how does that work? How a bunch of neurons can make you you? So that is one of the questions. Right? So Descartes had this solution in 1600. He would say, well, you have the mind and you have, this, you have the body and you have the soul. And the soul is different from the body. There are two different things. The soul is immaterial. It doesn't occupy space. And so that was his solution. But nowadays, that kind of thinking doesn't really work with science. Right? The question then becomes, how can we understand the functioning of a brain by just thinking of it as matter, stuff? And we don't know. We don't know how conscious, conscious, or consciousness really emerges, right? I mean, where does it come from? Why do you listen to a song and you have a certain reaction, and the person next to you will have a completely different reaction? The subject, subjectivity of emotions, it's a big question mark. We have no idea. That's called the hard problem of consciousness in, in philosophy. But yet, we are making things like this, so, that guy is Boris Kasparov, one of the great, greatest chess players ever. And on the right is an IBM computer called Deep Blue. And in the 90s, there are a series of games between the two, and Kasparov lost all of them. So a machine beat the best chess master you could think about. So that was like, machines are smarter than humans. Now, is that true? Is that machine, Deep Blue, an intelligent machine? And the answer is no, that is not an intelligent machine. That is a machine that has been programmed by very intelligent humans to be very good at the game of chess because what machines can do much better than we can is try out all possible combinations before they make a move incredibly fast. They're much faster than we are at that. But they did not invent chess. And that's the big one. You know, how do you invent chess? How do you invent the game? How do you invent the notion of programming? That's intelligence, creativity, right? What makes a Mona Lisa a Mona Lisa? You can develop a program now that would paint stuff that looks, oh, look at that, it's like a Monet, that looks like a Da Vinci, or you can compose symphonies like Mozart, or play a song that sounds like the Beatles, or whoever you like, but that doesn't mean they were the people that invented those things. So there's a big difference there. Google has this machine that <clears throat> beat the champion of Go, which is a Chinese game, which is much more complex than chess. And again, the question is, is that machine intelligent? Now, ha something big happened between Deep Blue and the Google machine, which is that now we have something called neural nets and machine learning, which means the machine becomes smarter at doing the same thing as long as it keeps doing it. So the more you feed data to the machine, the smarter it becomes at doing that thing. So is that machine intelligent? Not really, it's functionally intelligent. You know, it can do go very well, but it won't tell you how you go to the moon because that's not its program. So those intelligent machines, so artificial intelligence is not the Elon Musk devil on, on, on the planet thing. But it's something that is changing the world very fast because a lot of the stuff that we do has to do with machine intelligence and AI. When you go into Instagram and it knows what kind of um, ad to put for you, how does it know? Because it's machine learning. Basically, it knows what you buy. It creates a portfolio of who you are and what you like. And it presents to you products that you're going to buy. That's machine, machine uh, learning. That's some kind of functional applied artificial intelligence. You can do that with medical diagnosis. You're going to do that with intelligent cars. They're becoming smarter and smarter, right? You can buy a Tesla now that pretty much self drives itself, you know? So those things are happening. Those things are already changing the world because the market, the job market, is going to change with it because a lot of jobs that we now consider important very, very quickly are going to become obsolete. Truck drivers, you don't need truck drivers anymore because we have self-driving trucks. Mercedes-Benz 
has an 18-wheeler that is already moving in the roads of Arizona and Nevada. There has no driver. I mean, there's a guy sitting there just with a red button, you know, emergency button, but that person is not driving the truck. So there are about 4 million truck drivers in the US, school bus drivers, Uber drivers, all these people very quickly will become obsolete. And then what happens to that? What do you do with that great technological evolution? You have to retool them, you have to reskill them. But who's going to do that? Now, who's going to train a 50 year old truck driver to become a software programmer? It's a hard one. So these are questions that have always been here, in a sense, when Ford automated, you know, the uh, production line in 19, something like that, 1920, people said, oh, everybody's going to be without a job. No, new jobs are always being created. You know, so, so uh, my son, for example, he works for a company that wouldn't have existed. He worked for Google for many years, but then a company that wouldn't have existed because it depends completely on transactions, money transactions that happen in the internet, through the internet, right? So it's invisible parsing of money. But he learned how to do that, and it's a job that was not conceivable 20, 30 years ago. So new jobs are going to come up, but the question is going, always going to become, there's an ethical aspect to all of this, which has to do with what do you do with all this knowledge, right? I mean, and, and what do you do with the people you displace from the job market because of this? So every technological innovation has a, Light shed, a light side, you know, a beautiful side that can do all sorts of wonderful things, but it also has a shadow side, and we have to learn to think about these things, right? I already talked about that. I already talked about simulations, and I also mentioned the idea of the AI controlling the world. Honestly, that's not going to happen, okay? Because it's a much more complicated problem, you know. But these are questions that are present now. And by the time you graduate from college, they'll become even more important. And it'd be really good if you start thinking about these things, you know, and how they affect your life so that you'll be prepared for the world that you're living in and not just carry it on with the way, but actually become the people that actually can surf on the way as opposed to be, you know, drawn by it. You know, so it's really about awareness of what's going on. And it's super important to be in touch with the science, but also be in touch with what's going on as scientific progress change the world we live in, right? So are we going to see aliens? Probably not. Are we going to become the aliens? Very possibly. But that's a horizon of thousands and thousands of years. Now, we are the ones going out there to explore the universe. Meanwhile, we have a planet has some very serious problems that need very quick solutions and that we all need to work together to figure them out. All right, that's the story. And if you want to know more, I have a few books out there that you can go read in your ample spare time. <laughs>